Welcome to the Denison Forum podcast. I'm Dr. Mark Terman, Executive Director of Denison Forum, and we're glad to have you along with us for this next episode as we seek to equip you to discern your world differently, to discern it from a biblical standpoint so that you can think biblically, so that you can live holy and serve productively wherever God gives you an opportunity. We want to help you do that through conversations like this. Joining us today is Dr. John Inazu, who is the Sally D. Danforth Distinguished Professor of Law and Religion at Washington University in St. Louis. Let me tell you a little bit about John. He teaches criminal law, law and religion, and various First Amendment courses in his work. He is a former litigator, but he's also an author and frequent uh, speaker on the topics of pluralism, assembly, free speech, religious freedom, and other issues we might call lightweight, right? Uh, John has written three books, one of which we're going to talk a little bit about today. He has also written at times for the Washington Post, the Atlantic, the Chicago Tribune, the LA Times, USA Today, Newsweek, and CNN. He is also the founder of the Carver Project and the Legal Vocation Fellowship and is a senior fellow with Interfaith America. John, welcome to the Denison Forum podcast. We're glad to have you with us today. Mark, thanks so much. It's great to be with you. Well, I know as a professor, you're uh, on your way into another uh, semester of teaching. And so it's an intense time, but it's also going to be a unique time uh, in this political environment where faith and law and so many other things are intersecting. But uh, if you would, uh, tell us a little bit about you and maybe a little bit of your personal story, some of your, something about your faith. Uh, and then what is it that kind of prompted you to write this book that we're going to discuss today? Sure. So, um, you know, fresh off the summer, I'm thinking about uh, my wife, Caroline, and our three kids, uh, Lauren, Hannah, and Sam. We've just been doing some fun family travel and just uh, celebrated 20 years of marriage. Um, I was raised in a Christian home uh, and then became more serious about faith through the ministries of Young Life and InterVarsity Christian Fellowship uh, during high school and college and have been connected uh, since then. I, I served briefly as a youth pastor for a few years when I was in graduate school. So I've seen the inside of a, of a church staff in that capacity mm. and was also a volunteer, young life leader for a number of years. Uh, so that's sort of what, what forms me faith-wise and uh, we're part of an evangelical Presbyterian church here in St. Louis. And uh, in terms of the book, th- this book is called Learning to Disagree. And it was really grew out of the peak of COVID when I realized how much we were all distanced from one another and all the shouting we were doing over, over COVID policies and everything else, thinking, that, you know, the reminder that we're made to be in relationship with other people and we need to figure out better ways to do that and trying to think through how my own expertise and experience might contribute to it. So you can think of this book as taking what I do in the classroom, what I've done in my writing over a number of years, and then also just in my everyday life, how I try to, uh, with varying degrees of success and failure, try to apply these ideas of understanding difference, of learning empathy, of figuring out how to disagree better in, in life, in the classroom, and in law. Yeah, and that's uh, really a great place for us to start. Uh, as, as you said, the book is titled Learning to Disagree, the subtitle, the surprising, the surprising Path to Navigating Differences with Empathy and Respect. Um, John, uh, I've heard this term empathy talked about and, to- and thrown around really a lot more the last four or five years in my work as a pastor and uh, working with others, uh, often referring people to... Uh, talk with counselors uh, around different issues. Kind of give us the working definition that you use for the word empathy and how it might be different from something like sympathy or other terminology that we sometimes use in this kind of conversation. Yeah, I I actually don't employ too technical of a definition, but in distinction from sympathy, what I'm trying to get the reader to think about is something that more closely approximates someone else's experience. So can you understand what someone else is going through? Can you put yourself in their shoes? And then importantly, with the recognition that it won't always be fully possible, I'm not going to empathize with what it means to be a woman in our society today or or many other characteristics that I don't have. But there are ways through listening, through seeking to understand, through trying to imagine what a different perspective might be that we can move 
closer toward empathy than not. And then I think another piece of this for Christians is, I almost think of it as a, the relationship between empathy and discernment. So when we when we are called to speak the truth in love, we that doesn't mean we always have to speak. It just it just means that when we do speak, we speak truthfully and in love. And and so part of empathy might also be discerning times when we're not supposed to speak, when we're supposed to listen more, or just be alongside someone. Yeah, that's a good good distinction for us to understand. Um, how would you say that? Just being in the practice of law, studying law, teaching law now to uh, those that would become lawyers in the future, how has that kind of prepared you and enabled you to even to be more empathetic? Has it been, well, as a good lawyer, you need to you need to kind of position yourself of, well, if I was on the other side arguing the other end of this case, or if I was the judge, how would I be looking at that? Is, is that some of what the practice of law and the learning of law has helped you with? In terms of empathy, yeah, I think that's right. And you know, part of it is trying to overcome the presumption that many people have about lawyers as the people who are just stubborn and like to argue all the time. Mm-hmm. That is sometimes a well-earned description or feature of lawyers. But I, but to your point, I, I do think the best kind of lawyer and the best kind of lawyering is someone who really seeks to understand the other side's argument. Sometimes in order to defeat it. Sometimes because you want to look for potential moments or, or areas of compromise or creative solutions to solving problems, maybe even outside of the litigation process. But ultimately, you want to be able to go to a decision maker or a client or an adversary and say, this is a really hard issue. And here's why I think we disagree about it. And here's why I understand your argument, but I think my argument is more persuasive. Rather than saying, the other side is stupid and we're morally correct, right? To have a, a, a kind of nuance and an understanding of the complexity of issues. And I think law at its best teaches us how to do that. Yeah, and even in what you're indicating there kind of feels like a theme throughout the book that as I was working my way through it, which is to approach somebody, even if you know that you're going to have a difficult conversation or you feel like you need to have a difficult conversation with them, that even the way you begin is important. Um, and the way that you try to disarm uh, the emotional uh, temperature of the conversation. Can you kind of unpack that a little bit of, hey, I need to, I have a friend of mine that, that used to say, he, he, he was trying to start difficult conversations by saying, hey, I need to clarify something with you mm-hmm. and try to take the emotional charge out of it from the beginning. Is that part of what you're trying to teach us here? Yeah, it's certainly part of it. I would even take it a step further back and and suggest this is something I learned from Young Life that that before you even start to speak, you need to earn the right to be heard. Meaning, you need to be in a relationship of trust where the other person believes you think the best of them, believes that you care about them as a human being, believes you think that they're smart and intelligent, and and to be able to enter a conversation without assuming the superiority of your position or assuming that the other person wants to hear from you, but actually then mm-hmm. to make sure you're, you're focusing on the relationship first. I think there's a, there's a kind of 1990s apologetics out there in some Christian circles that is just, you know, if I can just get the truth out, if I can just get these five propositions out, surely someone will be convicted of the truth that I have. And I, I think that's a very fragile and and often unhealthy way to think of actual human relationships where people want to know, can I trust you? Do you love me? Do you care about me as a person? And all of that has to precede the propositions, however true they might be. Yeah, and, and as your book relates in several different chapters, that, that idea of relational capital and relational trust uh, really ought to be part of what we use to discern whether or not we should even have a conversation of a certain nature with somebody. Uh, as And maybe might cause us to be more quiet at times uh, <laughs> or to start at a different place. Um, uh, John, I'm, I'm wondering, um, do you feel like in writing this book and the research and the, and the work that you did putting in on it, do you feel like that our culture, our generation... Uh, is having a harder time with disagreement? Uh, and if so, what might be some of the reasons for that? 
Yeah, you know, I think in, in some ways it is harder. I mean, I, I often want to guard against a kind of presentism that makes us think it, it, this is as bad as ever been. I don't think that's mm-hmm. quite true. We've had certainly more disagreement and and more violent clashes in past eras of our history. But there are a couple of different factors that are contributing to the current moment feeling in a very real and visceral sense, more intense than we might have felt even a few decades ago. So one of them is that as we have allowed more voices to be heard in our country, in our cities, sometimes even in our churches, we have less consensus about what people believe. We have less consensus about what, you know, think of anything from culture to the music that you would hear in church. And there's more disagreement there. Some of that is a good thing, that welcoming other voices to the table that might have otherwise been excluded in past eras. But that dissonance also comes at a cost. And it means we can't assume as much consensus as we might have had in an earlier time. And that makes it harder and makes it feel uh, the stakes might be higher in trying to muddle through what our agreement actually is. And then, of course, another factor that exacerbates all of this is the social media bubble and world that we now find ourselves in, where we're being barraged with different viewpoints and having our own views reinforced not just once or twice a day by reading the paper or watching the news, which is what we might have done in an earlier era, but every couple of seconds or minutes, some some social media update is telling us what the breaking news is or why we should double down on our own prior assumptions about some contested issue. And that, I think, changes our brains and changes the way that we interact with news and people and events. And, And that's fundamentally different than how we were experiencing the world even a few years ago. Mm. Yeah, it seems to make us live on the edge of anxiety uh, almost all the time perpetually and can make it really, really difficult. As I uh, started working my way through your book, and we'll get to the the way that it's laid out, but um, one of the things that the description of the book um, that the publisher offered is that uh, you're trying to help us get to a place of nuanced disagreement. Uh, and that's another word, this word nuance that seems to get trafficked around quite a bit in a number of conversations. Um, but it feels like, John, that part of our disagreement is is that we don't have much tolerance for nuance. Um, can you kind of unpack that a little bit? Do you think that that's true? Why would we not want to recognize the complexity of the issues that we are sometimes talking about and realize that we have to pursue some kind of nuance because if there were black and white answers, they would have, they would have come up really quickly, right? Usually. (laughs) Right. Well, I I think we sometimes avoid nuance because black and white and extremes make for better sound bites. So Mm -hmm. it's, it's much easier to remember a lack of nuance or it's much easier to make a slogan or a talking point out of a lack of nuance. But in the world, of course, Most hard issues are hard for a reason. So when I tackle in this book really challenging questions of religious freedom or gay rights or criminal law or whatever it might be, there are complex legal and policy and moral and theological questions in play. And when those issues are channeled through our courts and our laws, they're usually not slam dunk. They're usually not unanimous opinions at the Supreme Court. They're usually contested and conflicting, and they're hard for a reason because there are powerful arguments on both sides and because there isn't, when it comes to the policy space especially, there's not a a clear answer that's just self-evident to everyone. And that doesn't mean that we just throw up our hands and say, it's all relativism. As Christians, we can never do that. We, We have to continue to pursue wisdom and prudence and and truth in the midst of how we engage in the world. But I think that starts with recognizing this is hard. This is complex. And even our our Christian beliefs and convictions are not always necessarily going to translate to one clear policy position that's evident in the world. Mm. Are you feeling anxious or overwhelmed by the intensity of this election season? As followers of Jesus, we're called to rise above the chaos and embrace a path of peace. But in a world where political tension runs high, that's often easier said than done. That's why Denison Forum has compiled all the resources you need in one place designed to help you navigate politics with faith and understanding. 
at denisonforum.org forward slash election, you'll find resources for every need. Whether you're looking for daily Christian perspectives on political news, guided prayers to keep your heart grounded, or tools to help your children understand the season from a faith-based perspective, we have you covered. These resources are here to help you filter through the noise and approach the political season with a biblical mindset. Equip yourself and your family today. Visit denisonforum.org forward slash election and embrace a faith-filled approach to politics this season. Together, let's rise above the chaos and stand firm in our faith. And that could be frustrating, uh, disappointing, uh, even annoying for Christians to realize that it it may just not come out to a real clean, easy uh, scripture and verse kind of answer, uh, which is something of the uniqueness of the role that you have in the work that you're doing, the intersection of both law and faith. Um, the book talks uh, significantly about the authority that comes from those different angles, the authority that comes from the law, the authority that can come from our understanding of faith. Can you talk about how those things intersect in this book and and how they need to be appreciated for both the contributions that they bring, both the contribution of law and faith? Well, you know, one thing that I think law and faith have in common is they both fundamentally depend on a kind of trust. Mm. Law is not always going to be perfect. In a human society of flawed human beings, we're going to get the law wrong. Judges are going to get some decisions wrong. Politicians are not always going to have completely pure motives. And, and that means we have to trust a larger system even when we're disappointed by individual results. It doesn't mean the system is always right, but if we lose comprehensive trust in the system, then we have to start thinking about, well, what are the alternatives to our system? And those alternatives are, are fairly bleak. You know, For all of its imperfections, to live in a law-governed democracy like the United States is a huge gift at a moment in history when we can look around the world and see alternatives that are very dire. And then there's a similar component with, with faith, which is that faith also requires a kind of trust. And I think there's a, a tendency for some Christians to want to replace this trust or this confidence with a kind of certainty and a kind of certainty that isn't really backed by faith. I mean, we can be clear and convicted about what scripture says about what we think and how we think we're supposed to lead our lives, but that doesn't translate to certainty in the same way that we can look at a math equation or something like that. And I think actually understanding faith as confidence and trust in the person and work in Jesus rather than a kind of certainty and a logical proposition is a, is a healthier way to engage with our own faith, but also gives us some pointers about how to engage with others in the world who might not think what we do. Yeah, and sometimes we can get really uncomfortable with that, um, uh, with, the, with the aspects of faith that are not mathematical in their certainty. <laughs> and there, is a, there is a certainty of faith and there is a confidence and a, 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 an assurance of faith, but it doesn't work like a math equation. Uh, and sometimes we get uh, uncomfortable with that. Uh, John, one of the uniquenesses of this book particularly and its helpfulness is uh, the unique way in which it's laid out. Um, and so I'm going to let you describe it rather than me describe it. But um, tell, us, tell us why the book or tell us how the book is laid out and tell us why it is laid out that way uh, if somebody imagines themselves as a first year law student. Yeah, so you can think of this book as a, a narrative-based story of a year in my life as a law teacher. And it takes the reader through an academic year. Each chapter is named after a month of the year. So chapter one is August when the academic year gets started. And then I walk the reader through the course of a year where I teach criminal law in the fall and law and religion in the spring. And then there are a whole lot of other events and episodes that emerge during the course of that year the reason I structured it this way is, is a growing conviction that people are, are drawn to stories and narratives much more than propositions or, or didactic uh, teaching about certain mm -hmm. things. And I wanted to have an account that engaged with the reader in a, a, a more compelling and relational way. But I also wanted to highlight these points of disagreement. So I, within each chapter, I, I focus on a single question 
related to this broader topic of learning to disagree. So for example, can, how do we learn empathy is, is framed around one of the chapters or is forgiveness possible? So at, even as we're marching through the course of an academic year, I'm also trying to raise a set of thematic questions along the way. And you know, this was a really fun and different project for me to do as, a, as an author and a scholar. But one of the things I realized was that in creating a narrative, I could also do some some character development and and show the reader along the way how people change over time, how I change over time, how I still have some learning to do on my own, uh, particularly as I recount my own failures uh, during the year. Yeah, and and it's a really uh, enjoyable rhythm, uh, especially uh, for all of us. All of us have gone to school, even if we haven't gone to law school or to some other kind of graduate level experience. We've all gone to school we all know the rhythms of what happens in August and in the fall and then how your feelings and, and the rhythms of your life change as you get toward the holidays and then into the spring. And uh, it took me a good while to learn how different I felt about a spring semester compared to how I felt about a fall <laughs> semester. Right. Um, but but we all identify with that, whether we're in the third grade or you know we're doing a law degree. We all have some sense of that because it's a part of our lives, and it. But it also speaks to some of the rhythms of how disagreements come. And I, I appreciated how you know you could you could be walking into a family gathering at Thanksgiving or Christmas and realize that that is an environment, especially today. A ripe environment for disagreement and for unhealthy conflict. And I appreciated the story uh, that you talked about there about how the discernment came to you that it just wasn't a good time to engage. So, um, talk about that a little bit more of just learning to discern the context of when we have certain kinds of conversations. Yeah, you know, so maybe the first point to mention is that. For a lot of us, and maybe some people listening uh, to this podcast, we we ought we can stand to be reminded that God does not need us to be His spokesperson on every issue under the mm. sun. Right? We are not yeah. called to engage every time we get uh, fired up by a social media post or every time we catch something wrong or awful in the world. We just don't have to do it. That, that um, God is not depending on us for all of those instances. He does want us to be his ambassadors and his reconcilers in the world. And so to do that well, we need to discern the relationships that we're called to be in. And then we need to invest in those wisely. So if we're looking at a difficult conversation, say with a family member or a longtime friend, we need to ask ourselves if we're ready to jump into that conversation. First of all, we'd better be going in with a full tank. We should have a kind of emotional and physical rest to us and an awareness of how difficult the conversation might be. Uh, Maybe even an anticipation that we're going to hear some things we don't like. And can we go in with a kind of thick skin that can absorb some some hits or some off-putting comments without just jumping reflexively back at the person? I mean, even that can be a tremendous form of witness if we just are able to absorb some of the comments rather than trying to preach back or... or, uh, intervene right away. And then in some relationships, it might actually be a reminder that we need to invest first in the relationship before the conversation. So I think about this, and I actually talked to quite a few people who are struggling with family dynamics right now. It could be politics or religion or some other issue. And they're thinking or they're saying, I feel like I don't even know this person anymore. And part of the reason for that is that they don't know this person anymore. Because even though there might be a very long shared history for the last few months or few years, maybe you've gone off to college or moved to a different state, and you're having a very different set of experiences and news sources and social circles influence your life. And that causes some rift and some division from from your past sets of relationships. So before jumping back into that really hard conversation, maybe we should start with something far more normal, something far more human, catching up over a meal or, or starting with some softer topics rather than jumping right into the divisive ones. Yeah, and just realizing that, you know, at our best or when we're at our best, we are growing and changing. And especially if it's somebody that you don't know at all or somebody you haven't engaged with in a long time, hopefully that person as well as you have learned and grown and 
some of their thoughts hopefully have matured and changed. And so you got to make room for that. Um, John, one, another one of these terms that, again, just floats around in our world a lot. Uh, I get into a lot of conversations where we, uh, where people say, you know, we just, we think in terms that are zero sum too much. Um, but your book calls this out. I love, I love the fact that you use terminology that people are trafficking in, sometimes maybe not as uh, well-versed as they should, but you bring these terms out and that makes the book very accessible to people who are not lawyers, people who uh, don't have the credentials that you have, but you're using experiences, stories, and terminology that you can find in just about every coffee shop that you walk into. Um, but you'll hear people often say, well, we're just thinking too much zero sum. Um, and as I read through that part of the book, I thought, well, John's making it very clear. There are some things that are just, they're zero sum. There's just no <laughs> other way around it. Um, it either has to be A or it has to be B. Um, talk about those kinds of conversations and that reality that we sometimes have this idea that, well, if we just keep plugging at it, we're going to get to that somehow neutral ground uh, that's you know somewhere between A and B, but that it can't, sometimes it can't be that. And we have right. to recognize it. Right. So, you know, starting with sort of the big principle here, in a diverse democracy where we have lots of different views over things that matter, we're going to have all kinds of political and policy conflicts where there are going to be winners and there are going to be losers. And you, you think of a lot of hot button issues, there is no middle ground where you can just agree that we've compromised effectively. These are going to be uh, very important issues where, where the sides are going to keep contesting. And because of the political process, there will be winners and there will be losers. And I, I try to illustrate this with a, a, a maybe a gentler example, but one that's kind of near and de dear to me, which is the, the collision of people who suffer from allergies and people who love pets when they mm -hmm. are in common places like airplanes. So I happen to be in the former category. I have allergies to quite a few different pets and trees and plants and those sorts of things. Uh, and so I'm all often taken aback when I sit down on a plane. I do a lot of travel and I'll be on a plane and next to me, the person in the next seat has a little carrier with a cat or a dog in it. And then quite, quite immediately, we're all breathing in the same air. And so that <laughs> dog or cat is having an effect on me. That's an example of a zero-sum situation. You, you either allow the person with the allergies to be allergy free on the airplane or you allow the person with the pet to be on the plane but we're not both going to have our preferences maximized in that mm -hmm. example and you know i mean as silly as it might sound there are real costs one way or the other uh, but because we are coming with different preferences and different perspectives someone has to make a decision sometimes that someone is the airline sometimes it's a regulator or a policymaker Sometimes the law backs a decision, and if you don't agree with it, you go to jail. And so these are these can be very consequential, uh, but they're everywhere in our lives, especially in a society where people don't always share our beliefs over things that matter. Yeah, and and then later it, it kind of came around in the book, and I wanted you to chase this out a little bit further from the standpoint that uh, we often get into conversations, especially when it becomes law and faith or law and religion. And the idea is sometimes touted that, well, when it comes to the intersection of law and religion, religion, religion should never yield. Um, and uh, you talk about that some, and you talk about that from the standpoint, well, let's talk about that a little bit more deeply because it's, it, we are in a world that, that not everyone shares our faith. Uh, and context for a particular situation matters a great deal in this. Chase that out a little bit more because some people, you know, they, they raise up phrases of separation of church and state and they, it's like, well, the, the idea sometimes among Christians particularly is, is that Christians should never yield even an inch within the framework of their faith when it comes to other matters of consideration and law as it relates to other people who, particularly those that don't share our faith. Um, right. I, th I think this starts with just recognizing where we are as a country and as a society. So 
I'm someone, I would actually be delighted if everybody shared my views and my beliefs over everything that I thought was important. You know, we might be able to disagree about ice cream flavors and sports teams, but when it comes to the existence of God and his plan for the world, I would love it if people all agreed with me. But as a fact of the world, they don't. And so then the ethical and political question for Christians is, well, what do you do in the reality of that disagreement? You could try to win at all costs and then control or coerce people to believe as you do. We've got a lot of history over thousands of years that that doesn't go very well, that people Mm. typically aren't coerced into belief anyway. And when we try, we do a lot of harm and a lot of damage. And so I I think the, the invention and the brilliance of civil liberties in the First Amendment in the American context is something that we can all embrace not just for our own protections, but also realizing that those same liberties are going to protect other people, mm-hmm. including people we don't agree with. And this is, I spent a lot of my time working in the areas of free speech and religious freedom. Those, those rights and those freedoms only work when they're for everyone. Mm-hmm. And a consequence of that for Christians who are advocating in these areas means that as we increase the breathing space for people to exercise their own religion or speak their own minds, we are allowing space for people to say things that we don't think are true, to to say and do things that we might even find harmful to society. But we would want those same freedoms for us because there are lots of people in society who think that about Christianity and Christian beliefs. And and so the, the, the overarching premise, I think, is we should maximize the ability to persuade one another In our words, in our actions, the best way to do that is to ensure strong civil liberties for everyone, not to seek special protection just for Christians or just for the people that we like. Yeah, and I love the way the the book calls that out. And the the opportunity of disagreeing deeply, but without a, a desire or without any intent of malice or harm toward each other, still the flexibility, the freedom that our country seems to have lost a significant amount of in the last five or 10 years of making, as you said, making breathing room for that. And so let me, from the standpoint of the book, let's move to the spring a little bit because uh, I was really intrigued by the, the conversation about the difference between wrong and between evil. Mm-hmm. And this is, I think, something that Christians really uh, struggle with, sometimes maybe the way that we've understood faith, the way that we've been taught certain elements about our faith, that this is something we may not have room for and maybe we need to grow in is a better, deeper understanding that you describe between wrongness and evil. Can can you kind of walk us through that some? Yeah, let me start maybe by pausing what I think should be two fairly non-controversial theological claims uh, for Christians. The first is that there is evil in the world. Evil is a reality of the world. You know, we trust that at the end of time, God conquers evil, but there is evil in the world for now. And the second is that every single human being is made in the image of God. Mm -hmm. So if you start with those two premises, then you have a conundrum because you, you want to both name the reality of evil and evil is sometimes manifested through people but right. also hold on to the, the reality that everybody is an image bearer. And so I think one way to do that is to work as much as we can to distinguish people from the ideas, beliefs, and practices that they hold and do in the world. And to mm-hmm. say, to you as a person, you're an image bearer. I might find your ideas and your actions very wrong and even evil, but I'm going to be committed to encountering you as a person. The, the, the challenge here is that when we lapse into calling the person evil or seeing the person as evil, we're no longer in the realm of disagreement. We're not trying to, you don't try to get along with evil. You try to eradicate and, and minimize evil in the world. And so to do that hard work of distinguishing people from the ideas they hold, and then as a matter of ordinary political discourse, just think about the difference between saying, I think you're wrong and I think you're evil. The Mm -hmm. first opens up a whole lot more room to have a discussion, to treat each other as equals, to learn from one another. If you you start a discussion by saying, I think you're evil, that discussion rarely goes well or rarely goes anywhere. Does does the law go down that road, John? Does the law ever 
contemplate or deal with the as the, the law is always dealing with right and wrong, but is the law itself ever trying to operate in the in the discerning of evil? It's it's interesting. I mean, there are some some uh, lesser known legal doctrines that go in that direction. So for example, in criminal homicide, there's something called depraved indifference homicide, where we say, mm -hmm. you know, people who murder people are bad and people who kill people are bad and they're doing bad things. But there's an even worse category of bad when you do something that's so egregious that we would think most ordinary people, even when they kill someone, wouldn't do it that way. And so with the mm -hmm. law in some jurisdictions creates this elevated category, which you can think of as more wrong than wrong in some ways. So there are right. examples out there, but I think one of the really useful features of the American criminal justice system is that we, you know, we presume innocence until proven guilty. We want mm. the humanity of the person charged with even a really bad and awful offense to be recognized by the courts and by the people who are judging them. Uh, that's very, that's hard to do in, in in the ordinary day to day when we see someone who has done really awful things to hold on to the rights and the dignity that even that person holds. And here, I think actually, you know, in our own systems of law and jurisprudence, it, Western societies owe much to Christian principles that have informed these notions of dignity and humanity, and and it's important to hold on to those. Mm. Yeah, a lot, lots to think about there, and and um, really some big intersections between faith and law at that point. Uh, John, in the subsequent chapter after that, uh, as we get around in in terms of the semester of the spring, we get around to the celebration of spring and the celebration of Easter, and um, you make a statement about forgiveness. You have a whole chapter uh, of you know, can we forgive? Will we forgive? Uh, and you made a statement that just really pierced me when it read when I read it. It said, uh, "Is have we decided that forgiveness is offensive, that it is repugnant to us in some way?" And I, I thought there was a really great insight. I won't get the quote exactly right, but you're like uh, the statement was: if if you never feel like you've ever significantly harmed another person, you're not going to have much appreciation for forgiveness. Um, but Talk about that idea that in our current culture, where it is so partisan and it is so um, combative and so intense at times in the kind of conversations that we're having with each other, um, and sometimes particularly online, but not limited to online, uh, unpack this idea of, especially for us as Christians, we we just cannot traffic in the area where forgiveness is offensive to us. No, that's right. You know, and, and this reminds me, probably worth saying, the book itself overall is not a Christian book. It's, as you know, it's meant to be engaged by anyone, you know, of, of any faith or of no faith, but it's mm -hmm. informed by some deeply Christian principles, including this notion of forgiveness. And one of the intellectual challenges I had in writing the book was how much can or should you translate ideas to a more general context? And, and forgiveness is one of those ideas that I, I think is so deeply rooted in Christianity and in the example of Jesus and the commands of Scripture that it's hard to know always how that might translate more generally and more broadly. But but I think for, for Christians, the dual insight that we both absolutely need forgiveness, mm. that we're not above forgiveness, right. and that we're capable of being forgiven. Uh, Tim Keller puts it something along the lines of, you know, we're we're more we're more love than we ever think we could deserve, and we're more in need of judgment than we ever think we might need. And and both mm -hmm. of those seem true. So for Christians to hold on to those uh, theological truths as we engage in the world, that we ourselves are always going to need to be forgiven, which should give us the capacity to to extend forgiveness to others. Um, but but then also that we we. We ourselves are forgiven, uh, which should allow us confidently to engage in the world. And you know, even if people don't reciprocate, to have the witness and the example of Christians forgiving in the world, how powerful is that? How powerful would that be if we saw more of it? Um, you know, the the idea that the the watching world would observe Christians forgiving each other well—that would be amazing to see more of that today. Yeah, if we could 
practice it in our own house, <laughs> then it would become much more appealing to those outside of our house. Um, but even your comment just then made me trigger my thought of uh, part of what you talk about in terms of, uh, well, if we're going we're gonna to pursue what you're calling us to in this book, which is to be people who disagree better uh, and hopefully arrive at greater resolutions with people uh, and but also end at healthier places even when we can't dis- when we can't come to an agreement. Um, but what about those times when we're not seeing that kind of empathy and patience, uh, a desire to forgive, a desire to understand the other person? When that's not being reciprocated, what should that tell us? What how should that be a guide to us? Uh, about what we should do next when we're engaged with this person around a topic that's hard for us to talk about. Yeah, you know, uh, two things that might be in some tension with each other. The first is that we we should expect in the world that if we're actually living out the fruits of the Spirit and demonstrating Christ's love to others, that we're going to encounter people who don't know or aren't capable of responding in the same way. You know, if they're not mm-hmm. Christians, if they're not motivated by the Holy Spirit. So we should expect some asymmetry and we should expect mm-hmm. some people not to be responding in kind. And when Jesus says, he doesn't just say, you know, love the people who agree with you or who treat you the same way. He says, love your enemies and right. and be patient with those around you. So we should expect a little bit of that, I think up to a point. And then this is where discernment and community jumps in. If you're in an individual relationship where you're really laying down your life and trying hard and the lack of reciprocity uh, crosses a line to a kind of abuse or an emotional intensity that you don't have the capacity to bear, then I think the beauty of community is the recognition that it's not always up to you in every single relationship. And maybe Mm -hmm. the best decision in, in that case is to step back from the relationship and let someone else handle it or work at it. So I, I don't think the advice is generalizable other than to say that discernment is important. And then in many cases, especially more ordinary cases, the expectation that we won't always see reciprocity if we're trying hard to lean into the fruits of the Spirit. Yeah, I think it's a really good word that you know we do know, and hopefully we are learning with Jesus, that we are to go the second mile. Um, that we are to be people who speak with grace, who serve with grace, and even sacrifice in grace and kind of take on more of uh, the burden than, you know, than perhaps we uh, would see in the world. Uh, but that's what we're called to be because that's what we've received in grace from God. But that does not mean that we continue to subject ourselves to uh, verbal kinds of abuse or anything like that. That's, I think, where Jesus was talking about being, you know, wise as a serpent and innocent as a dove. Uh, and that's part of the discernment in this. Uh, John, one of the things that people hear from us at Denison Forum all the time is what I call the, the graduate level education of faith, which is to speak the truth in love. Um, uh, we talk about that from Ephesians 4 on a regular basis. So much of what you've written in this book and the larger body of your work in other environments as well goes down that theme. Um, give us your inside view of how do, how do we get better as graduate level Christians at speaking the truth in love in mm-hmm. the environments that we're in? Yeah, I'm going to come at this uh, maybe a bit obliquely at first, but what I want to say is, make sure you have friends in your life who are truth tellers. Mm. And this is what I mean by that. Be, be surrounded by people who will be honest with you about whether you're someone who needs more courage to speak more truthfully more of the time or more discernment and restraint to speak less so that you can be more loving in the world. And, and we're not always very good at judging for ourselves which of those we are so that's where the importance of friendship really comes into play. Have people who can tell you, you know, I think actually, Mark, you should have a little more courage in this situation to speak up. And you can't always just dance around the issue. Or alternatively, it's time to pull back and listen more. And it's time maybe not to engage for a while. And I, I think friends are an incredible gift from God of how to do that better when we don't always see the way forward. Yeah, I think it's it's really helpful. I, you know, 
I don't know that it's true, but I would say I've certainly heard of a lot more people who have said to me, you know, I just, um, I, I, I'm afraid of conflict. I, I, I avoid conflict. Uh, and maybe there are more of those people in the world than those who are more of a combative mindset and love a good argument. I kind of grew up in a family that loved a good argument just for the <laughs> sake of the argument. Uh, some of my brothers uh, particularly were more adept at it than I was. Um, but uh, we have to realize there's both sides of that to us. Um, and that sometimes we need to speak up more uh, strongly. And sometimes we need to lay back, which is kind of where uh, I love the way the book ends because the book kind of ends on a Sabbath note, uh, which I think is important to us. You get to the end of a school year in May and you have a great summer vacation and you describe some of that at the end of the book. And there's even some lessons about how to disagree better in that. Um, Walk that out for a minute. Uh, How does that understanding of detaching and giving yourself some room. You've already referenced it a little bit earlier in the conversation of, you know what, you don't have to be an expert on every single topic in the world. Um, But talk about that as a rhythm of our life and putting some oxygen back into our lives and into our souls as a strategy for disagreeing in better ways. Yeah, and you know, I I owe a lot of this in my own life to my friend Andy Crouch, who was, was very persuasive in his admonitions, uh, you know, to do Sabbath weekly, but also, you know, to ex- the extent that your life and your job allows you to do so, uh, take a week a year and mm-hmm. and have a week of rest, especially a week offline. So a kind of tech Sabbath or a time away from the news and from social media and from email. Uh, not every job can can do this, but, you know, many, I think, with a lot of advanced preparation can and for me, the one of the most life-giving pieces of stepping away from all of it for a while is just to be reminded of how much my my day-to-day, whether it's what I do or my emotions or how I'm engaged with other people, is shaped by the constant influx of news and events and things in the world. And when I step away from that with my family or in nature or creation or just reading more deeply or going on a walk and praying, especially over the course of a week and not just, you know, for an hour or something like that, I can be reminded in a very powerful way, both of the the beauty of the world around me, but also of my insignificance to that world. And, Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean, you know, we're just, none of us is as a big a deal as we think we are and, and the world can go on without us. And I think a lot of people need that reminder, the, the reminder that we're, it's a privilege to be in the work that we have, whether it's ministry or law or teaching or something else, but that it's not because we're, we're needed in that space. It's because you know, God and his grace is letting us be used there um, but ultimately, his plans are going to go on and, and work with or without us so that to be in a, a posture of gratitude and a, an ability to receive and embrace the call rather than to try to control it, I think it makes a huge difference, at least in my own life. Yeah, it really uh, was a great reminder to me of just of uh, the humility that can come into that is to realize that God was running the world for a really long time before I showed up. <laughs> And he'll be, you know, if he chooses to, he'll be running it for a very long time after my time is done. But I also thought it was a very good call out for a law professor. I have a, I have a friend that went back to school uh, after starting one career, felt called into law and uh, made the very difficult challenge of going to law school uh, as a second career. Um And he'll be listening to this podcast. And I don't think there was a single law professor that recommended he take a Sabbath. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, most people in law school and in other kinds of graduate schools would say, yeah, that's a great idea. I don't know how that would work. Um, But it's so important, you know. Yeah, Um, maybe the serious point attached to that comment is if you can't figure it out with the training wheels of school, it's not going to happen in practice, right? When you're mm -hmm. into the practice of law and into the business, if you haven't worked on those hard rhythms in school, when you have a boss and a bunch of deadlines and clients, they're not going to come. So the stakes are kind of high in in terms of formation and practices because getting them right early on really matters downstream. 
Mm. Yeah, it's such a good word because some of the reasons that we're not disagreeing better or in getting to healthier conversations and resolutions is because we're living in perpetual fear. We're living in perpetual anxiety. We're living in a lot of times perpetual fatigue rather than taking that step back and letting God bring rest into our lives and, and getting a better perspective. Uh, you know, we try in the best efforts that we give sometimes, you know, how will I feel about this in three or five years? We just may not have the discipline to think about things like that as consistently as we should, unless we're consistently pulling back, getting that rest and getting that perspective that God really is in control and that God is not only real, but he is good. And he means good for us and for all of us. And that's his plan. Uh, John, thank you again for taking some time to talk today and for this conversation. It's been really helpful. I want to remind our listeners that this is John Inazu. The book is Learning to Disagree, The Surprising Path to Navigating Differences with Empathy and Respect. You can find that at all of the major book providers. You can also find, well, John, you tell us, What's the best way for people to follow you in your ongoing work if they want to do that? Oh, sure. Yeah, I've got a weekly substack that's called Some Assembly Required, and that's a good place to be in touch with me. All right. You can subscribe to that as I have, and uh, you'll be able to follow John's work. And uh, we appreciate you for listening in on our conversation today. I hope it's been encouraging as well as equipping. If it has, please rate, review us on your podcast platform and share this with family and friends. You might even consider picking up John's book. It's a great resource for small group discussion. There are some tools for that in the back of the book that will help you as you walk through some of these conversations and a way to strengthen not only your efforts at disagreeing well, but also those that uh, you traffic and share life with. Thank you for following our ministry at denisonforum.org. You can find more resources there as well. And we'll see you next time on the Denison Forum podcast.